So it's our uh, time for our next speaker, uh, Mohit Ayer. Uh, so Mohit is an uh, assistant professor in uh, the computer science department at the uh, University of uh, Massachusetts Amherst. His, uh, his research uh, focuses on uh, designing deep neural nets for both uh, traditional NLP tasks like question answering, semantic uh, analysis, and new problems that involve understanding creative language, uh, for example, uh, modeling uh, fictional narratives and characters. Uh, he received his PhD from University of Maryland, College Park, and then spent the following year at uh, AI2 as a researcher. And today he's gonna talk about contextual question answering and generation. Yeah, cool, thanks. Um, so today I wanna to talk about both some projects that have already been completed by uh, my group and also a couple ongoing projects. And the students who are uh, all associated with those projects are here and uh, presenting posters. So um, if you wanna learn more about them, you should uh, attend the poster session. Okay, so broadly, I wanna talk about three things. Um, most of this talk will center around generating questions um, or generating question answer pairs uh, from various forms of context. Um, we'll talk a little bit after that about a specific data set um, called Quack, which involves conversational question answering, so answering questions within like a dialogue style context. Uh, and finally, we will conclude by talking about um, some sort of pre-trained language modeling objectives for um, structured tables instead of just uh, unstructured text and how those could help potentially with question answering tasks. Okay, so we'll start um, with generation. Um, and so the first thing I wanna talk about is this project um, that my student Kalpesh in the back uh, did called Generating Question Answer Hierarchies. Um, and the basic motivation of this task is that if I'm a company or some large organization and I have access to huge amounts of text, I probably want to summarize or otherwise display the important contents of that text in a way that someone new to the company, say a new employee or a new customer, can um, make sense of it and get the important information out of it. And so I'm not just gonna give this employee like five million documents and say, go learn everything, right? I'm gonna try and help them um, through this process. And so there's various ways of making a text more readable. Um, obviously, there's formatting things you can do, right? I divide um, my document into paragraphs. I have titles like in my papers. Um, I can use various forms of markup to emphasize things. Um, and, you know, there's more um, sort of NLP tasks like summarizations that get to this, uh, this concept. Uh, and what we are actually proposing is more in, along the lines of FAQ generation, so like frequently asked questions. So given some sort of document or collection of documents, can we generate a bunch of question answer pairs that summarize the important information in that document? Um, and I, I mean, most of you are familiar with FAQs, probably have interacted with them. Um, I shouldn't have to convince you that there are useful forms of knowledge uh, storage, but anyway, if you want convincing, there are citations so that you can look up. Um, and our task is called squash, uh, specificity controlled question answer hier hierarchies. <laughs> um, so basically we take a document and we uh, generate this sort of forest of question answer pairs. So there's different levels as you can see here. Actually, maybe my cursor will show up. So in this top level of question answer pairs, we will um, mainly want to generate very general generic questions like what is this uh, document about or who are the main entities, uh, stuff like that. And then for every one of these general questions, we want to unfold them into more specific questions. So for example, if my general question was, you know, who is the main character in this uh, novel, then I might ask things like, you know, where were they born or who are they related to, things that are uh, related to that general question. And you know, the task is pretty broadly defined, so I can have you know, as many layers of the, the spe specificity as I want. 
But of course, in, um, when we actually did this project, we had to simplify things, so we looked at just two levels. Uh, and so I'll just start with an example that our model actually generated to give you an idea of how this works. So this is uh, a paragraph from the Wikipedia article on the Ben massive attack. And one of the paragraphs is talking about how they released some of their songs through this iPhone app called Phantom. And so one of the general questions that we produced was what was the iPhone application Phantom? Uh, seems reasonable. And uh, you can see a specific question, who created it, right? So this question is linked to the general question, um, whose parent it is. Uh, and so, so on. So we, for e every sentence, every important entity in this document, we will generate um, a question. We might generate specific questions for these general questions. We'll do some filtering afterwards to make the final uh, tree of questions look somewhat interpretable. That's our goal. Um, so with our two level question answer hierarchy, we have just general questions and specific questions. And so um, one problem that we encounter when we're trying to formulate this as a generation problem is that we don't have data for this, right? There's no huge scale, say, reading comprehension data set that has been annotated with this is a general question, this is a specific question. Um, but luckily, we uh, have access to some reading comprehension data sets, and there are people, there are p previous papers that tell us these certain kinds of classes of questions are general, and these are more specific. Um, so we basically use these uh, rules to automatically annotate some portion of existing reading comprehension data sets as either general or specific. Um, and then we manually annotate some percentage ourselves, train a classifier, uh, and annotate the rest of these data sets that, uh, automatically. Um, so this is the, the paper I was referencing uh, by Wendy Leonard from 1978. Um, this is actually a pretty fascinating paper. She categorizes every single possible type of question that anyone could ever ask into like 13 different classes. Um, and so for each of these classes, we initially started doing it this way. We were like, well, let's devise some rules or train a classifier to detect each of these 13 types. But um, that's very difficult. So we eventually collapsed the 13 types into just two categories, general and specific. Um, and afterwards, we had a crowdsourced annotation to see, you know, do actual mechanical Turk workers agree with our annotations? Would you say, given this question, that it's general or specific? And we got pretty high agreement. So um, the data set is uh, more or less high quality. So then doing a generation task like this is not as simple as simply training your seek-to-seek -seek model on um, question, uh, sorry, documents and questions. Um, we had this huge pipeline that we used to finally produce something that looked reasonable at the end. Um, so I'm gonna just briefly go through each of these steps, uh, which also explains how this uh, whole system works. So the first thing we did was given a single document, so here we're just dealing with single documents, not collections of documents. Um, given a single document, we're going to have a span selection step. So this step involves for um, everything in this document, what would make the best answers to, the, to any question that I could generate. So for example, entities, right, are usually pretty important. I might wanna ask a question about an entity. Um, or something else important that happened to an entity. Um, so for specific questions, we select just entities and numerics as answer spans to generate questions about. Um, for general questions, we had this idea that, well, their answers are probably longer than just a short span or a single entity, so maybe we can extend their answer spans to um, you know, sentences or more than that. Um, and so I should say at this point that we're using our, as our data sets uh, squad style reading comprehension data sets. So the answer is always marked as a span of text within the document. So once we have our candidate spans, right, things we want to ask questions about, um, 
then we, in our paper, train a seek-to-seek -seek model to generate these questions conditioned on the document and the answer span. Um, but after we submitted this paper and it was published, we decided to improve it by, instead of training from scratch, fine-tuning an existing language model to produce these questions. Um, that seemed to work a lot better, so we would highly recommend doing that if you were doing any sort of generation stuff um, at the moment. So we have, we train or fine tune our question generation system, and then we have to actually generate these questions, right? So that always involves a process of sampling from the trained model. Um, and the thing with uh, question generation is that many questions that you sample from the model won't be relevant at all. Like maybe they don't have anything to do with the answer span. Maybe they're ungrammatical. Maybe there's just something that you would never ask. Um, uh, so there's lots of things that could go wrong, uh, which is why we needed to have this filtering step. So um, one of the main ways in which we filter the generated questions is we took an existing question answering model and tried to use it to answer the questions that we generated. And if the uh, existing QA model produced answer spans for that question that matched the candidate answer span that we fed in, that's a good sign that this question is actually reasonable, right? But if it diverged, like if it said it was unanswerable, or if it said that the answer span is somewhere totally different in this document, then that's probably not a good sign, and maybe we wanna throw such a question out. And there were other things too to get rid of like ungrammatical questions and so on. Um, this filtering process was quite painful. Uh, finally, that was just the process to generate a single question from a single span, but we do this for all of these candidate spans. And then after, for those that pass through our filtering pipeline, we need to structure them into this hierarchy. So in our in this project, we don't actually learn the hierarchical um, nature of these squashed um, documents, but rather we just use a heuristic approach to, given independently generated questions, organize them into a meaningful um, uh, hierarchy. So here, for example, we have this article about Yoda and um, Star Wars and stuff, and so, in this general question, we generated this from this whole answer span, Yoda battles Palpatine and a lightsaber duel, blah, 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 that whole sentence. Um, so given that sentence, our model generated what happened in the battle. Um, and then for all of these highlighted entities, like Senate Rotunda, uh, we generated this specific question, where was the battle? And so as a post-processing step, we just assigned any specific question that was um, to the closest general questions answer. Um, so it's not learned, that's definitely something we wanna do for future work. And also none of these questions depend on each other when we're generating them. So this is another um, kind of weakness of our model. Yes? So, yeah, so I'll get to that. This is, we generate pronouns, but it's not because the model is actually intelligent and knows that it's already referenced this entity before, but rather that the data sets that we're using, um, some of them are dialogue-based QA, so they have pronouns in the questions. But how do you know that that word doesn't mean one or the We don't. <laughs> We don't, uh, oftentimes it does, but that's just, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's likely that this question would refer to the same entity as the general question because they're close in proximity. There's nothing else that forces them to be the case. We could have done some sort of uh, post-processing using CoRef systems to filter these out as well. We didn't go that far. Uh, probably. Um, so the, the underlying data sets are squad, um, Quack and Coca, I believe those probably contain some level of gender bias, depending on how they sampled Wikipedia articles. In Wikipedia, I think if they talk about one entity, usually the core F will be kind of. Yeah, so for example, in the Quack data set, um, which I'll talk about in a bit, we only um, used articles about people, so Wikipedia articles about people, and most Wikipedia articles about people are about men, so that's how you would get gender bias. In there. Yeah, so it could also be copying from the, the context. Yes? So 
when you gen when you generate a specific question, do you conditional on the general question? No. So, so you classify them later. Yeah. So we generate all of them independently. So that that specific question doesn't know that this is the general question that. Uh, but we would like to do this. It's just hard to get data for this kind of thing, right? We we only really know the general and specific labels, but getting some additional dependence, um, yeah, that would all have to be latent, um, becomes hard, so. <laughs> Well, yeah, but through proximity, they are more often than not still related. But yes, there's no constraint that makes them this way. Yeah, we we could uh, plausibly <laughs> uh, might be something to try in the future. So one thing I realized when we are asking questions, if we can say our name and where we are from, so that others can also know us. Yeah. Okay. Um, so if you have more questions about this, please talk to Kalpesh at his poster, which is also about this project. Uh, we'll also have a demo, so you can try it out on random articles. Um, yeah, so I guess I'll skip over these. Um, one thing I did want to show is the common types of errors that our model makes. And some of these are because of issues that you have raised already, like we don't have dependence between general and specific. We don't have dependence between adjacent questions. Uh, but still, like, there are some good things. So <laughs> it's not all bad. Uh, so in this example on William Jennings Bryant, the general questions are actually quite uh, interesting and informative. So what was a treaty is pretty generic. But why was this bad is, is, a, is a nice question, right? Um, people might want to know why this treaty uh, was bad and what was a result of the resolution. But on this right-hand side, um, things sort of fall apart. Um, so here, the general question, what are his uh, parents like? Um, if you look at the specific questions underneath, we get who was born in Springfield, so we get a good answer for this. Where was Weston born? So I guess I didn't believe that previous question's answer. Who were his parents? Where did he move to? And then this question, how old was Weston when he was born? Which is uh, <laughs> you know, clearly a lack of common sense. Uh, <laughs> Um, yeah, so uh, we would hope to improve. I think, so these, uh, this question at least was generated from our uh, train from scratch model. I wonder what would happen with the fine tune model um, if it were evaluated on the same document. May, hopefully that wouldn't happen, but um, yeah. Okay, so we evaluated this system primarily through crowdsourced human evaluations. Um, and some, in summary, um, people liked the quality of the questions. They thought they were relevant to the document. And they thought that more or less the hierarchies seemed reasonable compared to just a random hierarchy. So that's not a very strong um, statement. Um, but qualitatively, we don't generate many insightful questions. And I think one reason for this is because the data sets we're training on, so Squad and these Dialog QA data sets, themselves don't contain interesting questions, right? They're more like, where was this person born? Or, you know, what team did this other team play? Um, these are maybe useful in, for, you know, companies who want to isolate this kind of information, but we were more interested in questions that um, seem natural, that people would actually ask when they're trying to learn about some new topic. Um, and of course, all the problems that you've raised with the discourse. There's also the common sense um, problem. So the group killed their audition when they showed up in costume. How did the group die? Um, again, I don't know what would happen with the fine-tuned model, but um, yeah, this is obviously a problem with many generated uh, generation systems. Okay, and then one of our main motivations was that this would help people learn about things, right? Um, and one question that we actually wanted to answer when we started this project was, is this format of hierarchical question answer pairs or FAQ type things more useful for someone learning about a document than just a traditional summary? Uh, and this is not a question that we were able to answer in the end. Um, there is, you know, lots of prior work showing that hierarchies are generally good, uh, but this explicit comparison between FAQs and summaries has not been done before. Um, and what we are planning to do in the future to actually test this question is run a human study. 
Um, and one of the issues is that our system is not good enough at the moment, um, like compared to a traditional summarization system, for us to run a fair comparison. So what we would like to do is manually create some of these squashed versions of documents and compare them to gold summaries in like a uh, summarization data set. But we're still trying to figure out what the best way to set up this user study is. Like what is the end goal of the person participating? Uh, how do we measure how much they've learned? Did they take a quiz after learning, uh, reading the, the summary? Or, um, so these are all questions that were, you know, for NLP researchers, not really um, something we're too experienced in, in doing. But, um, you know, we want to do it to sort of advocate for this format in the future. All right, and if you want to play around with our demo, uh, you can go to this website and dump in random paragraphs and see what happens. So I wanted to, um, before I stop talking about generation, uh, quickly discuss some current work in progress that's kind of uh, stretching what we attempted to do here to explicitly a specific type of question that this squash uh, system could not generate before, or at least not well. And these are hypothetical questions. So what we did was um, we went through the common crawl, which is just a huge dump of the internet, uh, and we extracted all questions from the common crawl. Uh, so this was just with simple rules like any sentence that ends in a question mark. Uh, and you get a ton of them. So you get 570 million questions out of the common crawl. Uh, a lot of these are garbage. We uh, uh, tried some filtering to reduce the amount of garbage that we got. So we threw out all short questions. A lot of these are just like, um, you know, people expressing some emotion or something. Uh, so when we did that, we got about 280 million. And then we wanted to also have some context uh, with these questions. So we decided uh, we'll keep any question that has at least four sentences on each side so we can try to model some uh, context that led to generating that question as well as possible answers that occur after the question. Um, and then we did some annotation on these questions. So the common crawl is very noisy, right? Um, questions come from like Reddit or random blogs, or random articles. There's lots of non-English stuff. There, it's just a, a complete mess. So we did some annotation to see, you know, how many of these contexts, so how much of the text is actually coherent. So it's actually not as high as we had hoped. Like 23% of the contexts are unintelligible. Um, the questions, how meaningful are they? So more often than not, they make some sense and they're relevant to the context. Um, and um, yeah, I guess I'll skip over this. But the more interesting part is we did an analysis of what types of questions people ask in the common crawl, as opposed to, say, squad, where you just assume that everyone wants to ask these like factoid or questions about numerics. Um, but in the common crawl, it's, it's very different. So the, uh, many of the questions are rhetorical, which makes sense, right? These are people writing questions, they're maybe not asking them to be answered, but rather as like a writing device. Um, factual questions, so people asking for some sort of fact or information, is only a fourth of this data set. Um, a lot of it is people asking for an opinion, so how do you feel about you know, this product or something like that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so sorry, I should have said that. Yeah, so we took, uh, I forget how many questions, 200? Yeah, 260 questions. Um, and yeah, I just had my lab annotate them for <laughs> like one, uh, one and a half hours. And that's, that's how many we could annotate. So we just selected them at random. Um, this is pretty uh, unreliable at the moment. We haven't yet computed agreement on this whole thing. We need to get multiple annotators, but uh, it's still kind of interesting. Yeah, we, we might have to do more, um, yeah. But what we were actually interested in is this 18% of questions were hypothetical in nature. Uh, this kind of makes sense, like hypothetical questions people often use as a writing device. Um, so let's look at what 
the differences from simple factual questions to hypothetical questions. So here, what is the state capital of Minnesota? How many babies were born in Massachusetts? Where do we go to register for graduation? These are all things that you might find in squad, right? But what we find in the common crawl are more questions like, if Minnesota and neighboring states merge, where would the resulting state capital be? Or, you know, this other longer one. So, in general, these hypothetical questions consist of two parts. There's one like kind of imaginary scenario, uh, and it, it ranges from like very plausible situations, like you know, what would happen if so and so took office in whatever year, uh, to very like um, fanciful scenarios, right? Like what would happen if a, a unicorn attacked me uh, tomorrow or something? Um, so there, there's a wide range of these imaginary scenarios. And um, there's also this question that you ask about the hypothetical. So like given this imaginary scenario, I need to ask something that people would find somewhat interesting about that scenario. Um, so there's a lot of like common sense knowledge involved, I think, in um, trying to figure out, you know, like is this a reasonable hypothetical to ask given this context? And if so, what would I wonder about this hypothetical, right, out of the set of things that are reasonable to wonder about? Um, so we just did like some very preliminary uh, experiments where we used some rules to uh, identify hypothetical questions from the common crawl. Um, these are basically things like, does it contain uh, it, the word if in it, or does it have some length? Um, does it have prefixes like what would happen if blah, blah, blah. Um, so we can definitely do better, but uh, we just wanted to see what would happen. Um, so this context here is about the Super Bowl. Um, and the gold question is, if you had a choice, which one of the three would you rather listen to on television out of like three broadcasters, I guess? Um, and so when we're generating these hypotheticals, we seed our model with like a prefix that is sort of associated with hypothetical questions. So for example, what would or who would, the word would indicates that um, you're likely going to ask about some sort of hypothetical situation. Um, but if you actually read these, they don't actually make too much sense within the context. And even if we give the actual gold prefix, um, so the gold question in the common crawl was if you had a choice, blah, blah, blah. So we fed the language model if you had a choice. And it said if you had a choice between working four hours a day at whatever that is, or having to leave, which one would you choose? Which is like completely irrelevant. So um, it, this is like one of the, those cases where we were really unable to find many, if any, questions at all, which GPT-2 or its fine-tuned variant generated uh, even a remotely plausible question. Um, so that's kind of interesting, also a little uh, underwhelming. We were hoping for better, but um, we're hoping with uh, maybe integrating some of these, yes? Yeah, on our training split of that. Yes? Four. No, uh, <laughs> just randomly picked a number. Um, yeah, that, that could also be interesting, maybe increasing that. Um, yeah. Um, okay, so yeah, this is still work in progress. We're hoping with maybe using some of these newer common sense data sets and models such as Comet, um, which was recently proposed by some UW researchers, we'll be able to um, improve on this task. But um, still pretty fun, and we'll have to figure out what we'll actually use this for eventually. <laughs> uh, okay, so I, I think I'm, uh, be low on time, um, so maybe I'll go fast through this next part. Okay, so here I was going to talk about our Quack data set, which came out last year. Um, I'll basically just skim through it and show some examples, but mainly wanted to highlight the motivation of this. Um, it's another type of contextual question answering problem that in our squash project we cast as a question generation um, problem, uh, where we just ignored the dialogue context. But here, our main motivation was this to study information-seeking dialogue. So given that you want to learn about an area, but you know nothing about it, 
or you know very little about it, but you're talking to an expert who actually knows a lot of information about it, um, what questions would you ask? How would they respond to sort of encourage you to ask more questions? Um, and yeah, how, what are the, what is like the possible space of dialogue trees that could be produced from one of these dialogues? Oh, so I have an example here. Uh, I guess I'll go through it. <laughs> it's uh, pretty dumb, but this was a, a sort of real in example of an information seeking dialogue that I had when I went to Montana and I was hiking and I was afraid of, I saw a sign about bear attacks. So um, I, I, as the student here, was asking the, the hiking guide, um, how big are grizzly bears? And the, the guide said, they're huge. The adults can be like insanely large. So then, of course, I was wondering, do they attack humans? Um, and you know, the guide said, rarely, but that's not never. So um, I asked, since they're so big, how do I protect myself? And uh, the guide said this very uh, frightening statement, bear spray is usually effective. So of course, once I hear this, I'm going to ask more about, you know, like, when is it not effective? What do you mean by usually? And sometimes they're just like impervious to it and then walk through it. So then what do you do? And the guide says, oh, well, I play, you should play dead. Um, can I climb a tree instead of playing dead? Um, but they can climb trees too, apparently. Um, and then, you know, this is <laughs> a dumb question that I asked at the end. But you can see how um, this dialogue really unfolded as a result of the answers that I was receiving from the, the teacher or the, the expert. Um, so it's not like I knew everything before starting this conversation. The things that I learned influenced the questions that I asked next. And so we try to imitate this process in the data collection um, framework where um, unlike Squad and some other data sets, we did not let the person asking the questions actually see the context that they were asking the questions about. So I'll skip over this. Um, but we, were, we basically paired up two Mechanical Turk workers in a chat room, and one of them had a Wikipedia article. The other one had no access to this article. They just had the title. And so the one who just had access to the title, the student had to ask questions which were answered by spans of text from the document, um, from the worker who had access to that. Um, so we got about 14,000 of these dialogues with 100K questions total. Um, and it, it's pretty cool. There's, uh, there's a lot of interesting dialogue phenomena that are going on in this data set that um, people have mostly ignored in favor of uh, improving their leaderboard scores, <laughs> uh, which, is, which is fine also. Um, but one thing that was interesting about this data set when it came out is that there's a lot of uh, different types of questions. Um, so compared to data sets such as Squad, we have a lot more like why and how and how did kinds of questions that are, um, you know, people ask these more frequently when they don't already know the answers to the questions, I think. Um, okay, so uh, we evaluate this QA models on this data set using the same kind of squad style uh, F1 spin overlapped evaluation. Um, and we, in 2018, had our base model with like BIDAF and ELMO at that time uh, was the best thing out. Um, and got an F1 of 57. Uh, we are kind of proud now that this is one of the few data sets that BERT has not just destroyed. Um, it has improved significantly, but there's still, still some, something left. So this is a snapshot of the latest leaderboard. We see a few days ago there was history attentive trans BERT, which uh, got an F1 of 73. There's still some, some headroom here. Um, one thing that we are kind of worried about, which is um, why I kind of ask you this question, is that uh, we've noticed that many of the more recent submissions to our leaderboard are from these giant industry labs, and we're kind of worried that the architectures or the models that are proposed here are not actually um, what's getting them this performance, but just the fact that they are able to do much more hyperparameter search than, say, an academic research lab. Yes?
Yeah, but it is sad for the ideas that may have worked, but just we weren't able to find the right parameters. Um, yeah, I think this is the more likely thing is that at some point, you know, everyone will try tuning, it'll be tuned too much like squad was, and then many of those models will not be used again, but we'll move on to the next task and there'll be something that hopefully um, links all of these leaderboards together. Okay, um, so I will go quickly through this final thing, which is about um, kind of shifting these ideas that people have had about contextualized language models, large scale pre-trained language models, to structured data in the form of tables, where I think we can also benefit from these same ideas. So to give an example of the kinds of QA problems that I'm interested in in this space, um, basically if you imagine like an HTML table or some small database, uh, here's one from Wikipedia on the Women's Water Polo World Cup. We have some uh, columns, we have some cells, and we might have a question like which nations competed in the Water Polo World Cup. And so we treat this as a semantic parsing problem, so different than reading comprehension. Here, we want to produce a logical form that we can execute over this database table to um, give us the answer. So here, I might, in a SQL-like language, generate something like select nation. Um, and then this can be executed to return the, the cells and the answer. Um, so we had this data set, which is kind of similar to Quack in that it, it basically does conversational QA over tables. Um, so I can have contextualized questions like, of these nations, which one took home at least one gold medal, which re refers to the previous questions answered. Yes? Oh, you mean, wh wait, wh sorry, I didn't quite understand. This is more of a participating in the final of the water cup. Oh, yes, sure, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, yeah, who knows what this table is actually showing. Uh, but yeah, it's probably the final. I, I would expect more than five seconds. Yeah, 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 no, I definitely chopped it off to fit on the slide. <laughs> um, okay, so. Uh, quick high level overview of how we solve problems like this. Uh, when we collect the data, we have uh, mechanical Turk workers again, write these questions and then highlight the cells in the table that correspond to the answers. So here, just like squad and other data sets, we have the constraint that the answer must be in the table. Um, so with this, we do not have them provide the uh, logical form, right? We don't have them write out a SQL statement. That would be, um, you know, you can't expect that from a mechanical Turk worker. So we only know the final answer and the question, but not the intermediate logical form. So we treat this as a um, semantic parsing problem. Uh, we have only weak supervision. And so in this particular paper, we use something called reward-guided structured output learning to solve this. Um, so I'm just gonna go over the intuition of how this works. If you have a question like which nations won exactly one gold medal, um, we're just going to search through the space of all possible valid SQL commands. Um, and we're gonna intelligently search through this space, but we're basically going to do a search uh, it's guided by this policy function. Um, and at the end of the search, after we've completed and we found like some a number of SQL statements, we're going to pick the one that has the most overlap with the ground truth answer. So when we execute it over the table. So for example, select nation where rank equals four gives me the identical answer to the question, which nations won exactly one gold medal. Of course, this logical form does not correspond to this question. It's just a coincidence that the answers happen to be the same, but through this search process, we might find this path. And so we're going to use this path that we found as supervision for um, training the model to favor this, uh, this SQL statement next time around. Um, so it's like an approximate um, ground truth that we find in one pass, and then we update our model in the, another pass. Um, but this is sort of irre irrelevant to the, the point I wanna make, which is 
um, our model that we trained on this data set is very bad. Uh, it gets um, like 12% accuracy on, on this data set. And so we did an error analysis to figure out what is going on here. Um, granted, this was uh, a couple years ago, so maybe you know, with the new things we would do better. But uh, one of the biggest problems was that we lack enough world knowledge to match entities or some text in the question to cells or headers in the table. So as an example, this is uh, in our data set, we have this, this is a, a, again a subset of a, of a table where we have these three columns, call sign, city, and genre, and then a question like what radio station plays synthwave music? So to answer this question, you really need to be able to map radio station in the question to call sign in the table. But this is just something that the model is gonna have a tough time learning. I mean, this is not all of the columns in this table. There are probably 15 or 20 of them, so it becomes very challenging. So um, this uh, work with uh, June, who's sitting over there and presenting a poster about it is, can we improve uh, on this problem by using contextualized table representations? So traditionally, you might encode each of these cells separately, like with, say, glove embeddings or fast text or BERT or whatever. Um, and then you might learn from scratch some sort of uh, model on top that combines information across the cells in the table. But that model can actually be learned through some sort of pre-training process. So that's what we uh, wanna do here. Um, and I think people are now using this term self-supervision self for things like this, so we're also gonna use it. Uh, so given this table, we can design a bunch of self-supervised objectives that can help us learn good representations for cells or rows or columns. So for example, given the representation of the cell, can I predict which of these column headers it belongs to, right? I can do this for free if I have you know, a ton of tables. So what June has done is, um, again, using the, uh, sorry, using Wikipedia, extracted like 1.5 million tables. And now we have a you know, pretty big data set to um, train these kinds of representations on. So this is just one example of an objective. You can also do things like, given two cells, should they be in the same column or not? Um, we can have embeddings for rows in the, in the table and then ask, uh, you know, given this row embedding, do these cells belong to this row, um, and so on. So there's, there's a lot of room for exploration here. Um, and yeah, I guess I'll conclude by saying you should talk to June for more details about that. Can I ask a quick question? Yes. I don't understand why the pre-training would help you solve the entity dimension. Yeah, so that's a good question too. Um, we are looking at this like if we have better table embeddings, it'll just help us in general, but there is the problem where our question text is not in included. So that's another thing that we're considering including in this table embedding project where we can also extract the sentence or text in Wikipedia that references the table. Yeah, so that's something that we're also considering doing. Um, it's, it's just kind of hard because the tables are often referenced very obliquely, like it might just say parentheses table four, but it's not very clear why it's being referenced or maybe for some very specific thing. So, um, but yeah, this is definitely something we're considering doing um, in, the, in the future. Uh, I'm not familiar with this work. Oh, uh, yeah, so I don't think Percy ever did something on huge scale table. Oh, yeah, yeah, so wiki table questions, um, yeah. So our data set, this, this one that these questions came from, uh, it, it was built from wiki table questions. We basically asked people to decompose that or have a conversation about these tables. Yeah, so it's, it's using the same tables as that data set. All right, so that's it, um, thanks. We have a quick one minute for a uh, question, if anyone has any. So I have a quick question. Like yes. uh, some of your slides were showing examples of uh, question generation from existing question answering systems that work for English. Let's say, how would you, uh, do you have any ideas of fine tuning them for other languages? Yeah, so one thing that we noticed is the, the common crawl has um, huge amounts of text in other languages as well. So a lot of the stuff we're doing now is reliant on the common crawl. Um, obviously English is the primary language, but 
uh, oftentimes in these pre-processed dumps of the common crawl that people release, they remove all non-English text. Um, so I think if you wanted to do stuff on different languages, I mean, oftentimes people do things on different languages, Wikipedia pages, but those are usually very small for many languages, right? Um, I, I, one of my colleagues at UMass, Brendan O'Connor, did this study of mapping the number of Wikipedia articles for a particular language to the number of speakers that language has. And um, there are so many languages with a huge amount of speakers, lots of Indian languages, for instance, that have very small Wikipedia pages. So I think we need to look at other sources of data for these things. Um, uh, creating these resources like Squad and so on for are, is obviously very expensive. So um, that's why we've kind of shifted to just using, um, you know, common crawl, things like that. But I don't know, it might not be enough, um, yeah. Um, the question will be quick. I don't know if the answer will be quick. Um, so you've created a bunch of question answering data sets now, right? Like, so I want you to sort of comment on a little bit on, um, you know, how difficult it is to create data sets that do not have weird artifacts and things yeah, like that. Yeah, so this. that's any lessons learned, and you know, do you see this? How how to improve the way we are building data sets? That, that's a great question. So this is why I don't want to create such crowdsourced data sets in the future, I'm done with it. <laughs> uh, so even in Quack, uh, this was probably the data set that we spent by far the most effort on trying to remove uh, or reduce the uh, amount of noticeable artifacts we could get. But it was very challenging. There are so many ways for crowd workers to game any sort of payment system. Uh, for instance, they realized that uh, by having longer dialogues, they got paid more. This was one of our incentives to make the data set bigger. But then we noticed people typing in the question text itself, um, please don't say unanswerable because it will kill our dialogue, so we need to continue, did you give me an <laughs> So we had, there, there's so many things like this. Like you try and do something good, um, you try and encourage longer dialogues, for instance, but then it always will backfire. And I think many data sets, uh, another point is that um, mechanical Turk workers, for instance, they don't have, they won't read a long set of instructions. And many of the tasks that NLP researchers um, want to collect data for are actually very complicated. They have lots of edge cases. They have, you know, desired behavior in certain instances. And you can't, they're not going to read that. Um, and th that, that's why, like, if you look at uh, SNLI, for example, the instructions are very vague, the instructions that were shown to the crowd workers. Uh, I think that is actually the source of many of the artifacts in that data set. Like, what is a, a neutral pair of sentences versus a contradiction? It's kind of very blurry, and the examples weren't clear. And one thing I think the, the field should do is um, ha sort of have a, a study on the impact of all of these uh, sort of annotation design level decisions on the quality of the data set. So, like, if I reworded my instructions in this way and showed a different set of examples, would that give me better agreement or uh, less artifacts or something like that? I think that would be pretty cool. But yeah, right now I'm not doing any more <laughs> such uh, projects. All right, let's thank Moed again. Yes.